My name is Canon Penny Anderson. I'm delighted to welcome you to worship at St. Christopher's Church in Burlington, Ontario. It's good that you're here. Today, we begin a four-part sermon series called Making Global Justice Local. Our clergy will take up big questions, not to promote personal theories or to take sides in complex situations. Instead, we will offer analysis and challenge you to reconsider cherished views so that we can learn to move forward in challenging situations close to where we live. Today's subject is the conflict in Palestine and Israel. Thank you for joining us in learning and in action. Our land acknowledgement has a new significance for me following the news we are all slowly absorbing about the 215 children who died at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Evidence of the genocide carried out by our government and our churches is appalling. The deaths of these children is heartbreaking. We will not accept silence from our elected leaders. Meanwhile, we make our homes in the lands and we use the waterways that were stewarded by the indigenous peoples who lived here through countless generations. We acknowledge the ways that we ourselves benefit from the unjust actions of settler governments with their colonial policies. We commit ourselves to learning what justice looks like in this situation. We commit to examining our own complicity in colonial structures and we commit to the process of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Let us pray. God of the nations, without justice, there can be no peace. Inspire in us and in our elected leaders such a hunger for justice that all our decisions will be guided by your wisdom and all our actions will reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, who embodies the way of nonviolence. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also are they doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will take your male and female slaves, and the best of your cattle and donkeys, and put them to work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, 
but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Holy Word, Holy Wisdom. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. And the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will for be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat near him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother the Gospel of Christ. I pray I speak in the name of the one and triune God. Israel, Palestine. <laughs> Don't shout at me. Well, not altogether anyway. So much to say. During the, the recent crisis in, in Gaza, the Jerusalem Post, the newspaper, reported that tens of millions of evangelical Christians are expected to pray for Israel in their churches on Sunday. Well, fair enough, I suppose, fair enough, but um, I wonder if they also prayed for the people of Gaza, who had little protection against Israel's bombardment, no iron dome, and, well, they already live in appalling conditions. Better surely for Christians, for all Christians, to pray for justice and peace and a fair and balanced solution and the dignity of all people in the region, whatever their faith or their politics. Now I say this, as you realize, as an ordained Anglican cleric, but also one with three Jewish grandparents, one of them from a Holocaust family. I've also spent a great deal of time in Israel, and I reported as a journalist on the 2006 Lebanon War. In other words, I have connection as well as experience. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when churches turn this tragic situation of Israel and Palestine into, or into some sort of political and theological fetish, taking sides without context and choosing friends without understanding. I've also discovered at great cost that whatever one says about the conflict, someone's going to be offended and condemn you in often rather ugly terms. So be it. 
Here's a painful but inescapable truth. If Christians had acted in the genuine spirit of Jesus, there would have been no expulsions of Jews, no mass slaughters, no pogroms, no holocaust. Anti-Semitism was an open wound in Europe for 2,000 years, and it still screams its horrors. My first experience of it, by the way, was when I was ordered out of a little boy's house by his father because I was a Jew. I was seven years old. If Jewish people had been treated properly, it's unlikely Israel would have come into being in 1948. The Jews cried out for a homeland where they could have dignity and safety. My golly, fully understandable. But, but, the birth defect of that creation, the birth defect of that event was the expulsion and oppression of the Palestinian people. It's lasted for 73 years, and the most recent horrors in Gaza, they're, they're merely a symptom of the original injustice. Now, Christians are divided. Most evangelicals, as I'm sure you know, most evangelical churches, they've taken a pronounced pro-Israel line. But there's a major difference between a post-Holocaust theology that beautifully emphasizes the long-expunged Jewishness of Jesus and an extremist eschatology that ignores the plight of the Palestinians and empowers the most extreme in Jewish circles. This, this morbid desire to fight an end times war, Armageddon, to the last Jew and the last Palestinian, by the way, in some bizarre belief that this will lead to the second coming, well, it's not only barbaric, but it's a grim, infantile, dangerous misreading of scripture. Then, of course, there are, there are more liberal Christians who stand with the Palestinians. I understand that, because the Israeli capacity to do violence is so much greater and more horrific, far more horrific than that of the Palestinians. But please give time and heart to the Jewish experience and the Jewish narrative. Spend time in the West Bank, by all means. Ah, but if only such solidarity had been shown to the Jews of Russia and Ukraine in the 1890s, my ancestors, or Berlin, Paris, Warsaw, or pretty much anywhere else in 1940. There's a litany of realities that are often overlooked. The Palestinians have been, and they are, treated terribly. The Arab states have been hypocritical and unethical, often suppressing their own people as badly, sometimes far worse. Some in the Muslim world, they boast fraternity with Palestine, but they govern in the most despotic way. Anti-Semitism is filthy, and even Jewish people indifferent to the Middle East have been its victims just recently. The United States, and formerly the Soviet Union, they used the region for proxy war, testing out their weapons vicariously, more concerned with power politics than humanity and morality. There's no short-term solution to this quagmire. But I do know that on my many travels to Israel and Palestine, what astounds me is not the extremism, but the sheer decency of people on all sides. And here's where the church comes in. Here's, well, where you come in. We believe, as followers of Christ, as followers of Yeshua, we believe in the absolute dignity of every person, regardless of their race, religion, color, sexuality. We believe in a Bible that calls for cycles and circles of war and violence and revenge and retribution to be broken, to be shattered and smashed like the evil mirror that they are. But it's not only Jesus who says this. It's not just the New Testament. It's in the Hebrew Scriptures too. It is not anti-Semitic to want peace in the Middle East, where Jews and Arabs can live in peace. Indeed, those few anti-Semites, those who do hate the race of Jesus, and Mary, and Peter, and Paul, and Matthew, and Mark, and so on, they don't actually want peace for anybody. We have to go forward in prayer and in empathy. Now that's important, it's important, empathy. Feel for the Palestinian forced from his home. Feel for the Polish Jew whose family was slaughtered 
and wants anywhere to call a safe home. Feel for the vast majority of people in that tiny strip of land, whatever their religion, who merely want to raise their children, love their family, smile, sing, and dance. A miracle? Well, there are precedents, especially in that neighborhood. It won't be easy, of course. I mean, I know that. Really, I know that. But then Christianity isn't easy because it demands a complete transformation. We owe it to both of these victim peoples, yes, victim peoples, Jew and Palestinian, to show Christian love, Christian justice, Christian understanding of what is going on. Now, I can't give you a one, two, three absolute solution to this, and anyone who claims they can, don't listen to them. But I can remind all of us as followers of Jesus what we have to do. Love, justice, understanding, compromise, reason, knowledge. Most of all, love. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. One God. One love. I pray I have spoken in the name of the one and triune God. This morning's hymn is one of my favorites. That's because of the text. It was written by a Canadian in 1968, so right in the heart of the peace movement. Both the lyricist and the melody writer are Canadian. They met at St. George's Anglican Church in Quebec, where Robert Fleming was the director of music and Francis Wheeler Davies, the lyricist, sang in the choir. Each verse begins with a four-word imperative that is taken straight out of scripture. Many of the images you'll see on the screen were also used in our video of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear from December, which is another hymn about building a better world. Among these is a sculpture of a peace angel by American contemporary artist Lynn Evola, who takes decommissioned weapons and melts them into sculptures of angels. The last image is by another living American artist, James Janknick. His painting is called, I Make All Things New. Our choir this morning is an unusual composition. There are three sopranos, no altos, four tenors and four basses. Usually the problem is not enough low voices, but the result is a rich sound, so it's all good. As I mentioned last week, it's been about a year since our first virtual recording. And as the choir heads into the summer break, and we anticipate the opportunity to make more live music in the not too distant future, this might be our last one. I hope you'll join us in singing this prayer for peace.
A divided house cannot stand, and a divided kingdom will crumble. From the beginning of his ministry, as told by Mark, Jesus has been dealing with divided houses and kingdoms. He has cast out demons, cleansed a leper, and caused a paralytic to walk. The houses and kingdoms of these people are divided. Their lives are not their own. They live with inner conflict and turmoil. This division and inner conflict is a reality of today's world and our lives. A marriage divided becomes a divorce. A nation divided results in vitriolic politics and, in the extreme, civil war. An economy divided yields poverty and injustice. A community divided becomes individualism and tribalism, prejudice and violence. And humanity divided is all these things on a global level. We all know what it's like to lead a divided life. You know, those times when your outsides and your insides don't match up. That's what it means to be a house divided. You're one person at work, another at home. You act one way with certain people and a different way with other people. Life gets divided into pieces. Behavior, belief, and ethics become situational. There's the work life, the family life, the prayer life, the personal life, and the social life. Pretty soon, we're left with just a bunch of pieces. What is it that fragments your life? Anger, resentment, greed, insecurity, perfectionism, sorrow, loss, fear, envy, guilt, loneliness. Christ is stronger than anything that fragments our lives. Jesus always stands before us as the image of unity, wholeness, integration. He is the stronger one. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He puts our lives and houses back in order. He binds the forces that divide, heals the wounds that separate, and refashes, refashions pieces into a new whole. There is nothing about your life or mine that cannot be put back together by the love of God in Christ. So united today as one body in Christ, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. So to the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. In the worldwide Anglican communion, we pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar. And in the Niagara Diocese, we pray for the ministers and the people of the parish of St. George, Lowville. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them. Today, we remember in particular W.G and B.V. Sheard, C.J. Sheard, Bruce Maddox, Christopher Michael Perun, Jim Pritchard, Alice and Lewis Smith, Barry Ribbons, Audrey Rizitnik. We pray also for members of our own families who have risen in greater glory. Please take a moment now to offer your own petitions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, bless all those suffering from physical or mental illness. Give them courage, hope, and peace in the knowledge that you are present in their pain and suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Supporting God, 
as parts of the world continue to struggle to contain the spread of COVID-19 and others are in the process of reopening their economies and returning to their new normal. Help us to stay the course of social distancing and self-isolation just a little longer, confident that there is a light at the end of this dark tunnel. We are almost there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for those lost in the recent avalanche in the Rockies. We pray for all those affected by volcanic eruptions, flooding, fires, and other natural disasters brought on by climate change. Help us to do anything we can, no matter how small a part it may seem, to help restore balance to your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This week, to close, I have chosen a poem written by Emily Jane Henry on May 29th at 1.24 p.m. This piece was written in honor of the 215 First Nations children, some as young as three years old, buried without any acknowledgement or dignity. In most cases, their parents were not even told the truth. They were simply told that their children ran away. Imagine the pain and anguish that those parents had to experience for the rest of their lives, not knowing. Number 215, we searched for you. You were supposed to come home. Instead, the robes came. They told us that you ran away. We told them that you would never run away. We told them that you were too young to run away. We told them that you were afraid of the dark. We begged them to find you. We begged them for mercy. We begged them to pray to their God for help. They stood there, firm. They stood there, cold. They stood there, unfeeling. They said that you ran away. They said they had been looking for months. They said you weren't going to come home. They were right. You didn't come home. Your dad and I searched for you. Your siblings and grandparents searched for you. Your uncles, aunts, and relatives searched for you. We couldn't find you. You began to appear in our dreams. You were always near the school. You told us that you did not run away. We searched again and again. Your dad searched until he died. A few days ago, I found you. I heard it on the news. They said the number 215. I felt you jump for joy. You were found. I told them that you wouldn't run away. God of justice, help us to acknowledge our past and to strive to do better, to treat all people equally with dignity and respect, and as a nation to stand up and say, never again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our, Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Together, as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God, you walk with us through the places where there are no easy answers. Hear our prayers for those who suffer in Gaza and the West Bank and within the political boundaries of the State of Israel. Hear our prayers for peace in the Middle East and throughout the world through Jesus Christ, who embodies your peace. Amen. I will give you a blessing. Be joyful in hope. Be steadfast in faith. Be untiring in love all the days of your life. And may you be filled with the blessings poured out by the God who creates and calls and empowers us. Amen.